All right, we're going to get started. So thank you so much for joining the Next Society's webinar on research priorities for the NET community. We are really honored to dedicate this webinar to the patient and families that have served on our leadership team. So you'll see many of their faces here. And we're really grateful to these families um, for just really helping to move this work forward. I want to share that this is our 17th webinar that the Next Society has hosted. And we have um, all but one of the recordings are available on our website. I believe my colleague Erin just shared that link in the chat box. So if you'd like to check out some of the previous re webinar recordings, um, they're available on our website. And just want to remind you that we are committed to building a more just, equitable world without this devastating disease. And we're really just so grateful to have you here and to have you be part of this community. So we're going to get started. So if anyone is just getting to know the Next Society, welcome. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's dedicated to building a world without neck. We work hard to advance research, education, and advocacy around this disease, and we work really hard to keep patient and family centered in everything that we do. So these are some of the photos from our 2019 Next Symposium, and we hope to get back in person with you all very soon. So it is Neck Awareness Month, and throughout the month we have been highlighting how many um, research um, areas of research we still need because m much of NEC is a mystery. We have so many unanswered questions. And so that's why we're here today to talk to you about the research priority work that we've been doing. We just released a series of three videos that highlight this work around um, the unanswered research questions in the NEC community and the need for us to um, begin really dedicating more of our resources and time to these really urgent and impactful questions. So we hope you'll check out those videos and share them with your colleagues so that others can um, learn about this work. So here um, is who you're going to hear from today. I always forget to introduce myself, so let me do that. For anyone who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Jen. I'm the founder and executive director of the Next Society, and I lost my son Micah to complications of NAC just before his first birthday. And I'm really um, honored and grateful to collaborate with the really incredible team that makes the Next Society possible. Many of who are not, um, you're not going to see today on this webinar, but we're really crucial to this work. So um, you'll hear from today is Ravi, who serves on our Scientific Advisory Council and really helped to lead this project. Uh, Lindsay Green, and she works for the Next Society and is the Next Survivor herself. Um, Toby, who's a neonatologist and at Pittsburgh and also was really critical to the work of this project. Same thing with Jay Kim. Uh, he's a neonatologist at Cincinnati um, and was, is one of our founding council members in NAS, who actually helped lead the NEC UK charity. So we're really grateful and excited to have this team with, uh, with us today. Quick disclaimer, we are not providing medical advice, we never do, and all of our faculty views are independent from the Next Society. Some quick disclosures that we'd like to share, um, you can check those out here from Robbie and Jay. Um, the other presenters have nothing to disclose. So um, we're gonna get into some of the core work now around um, the research priorities that we've been doing. So this work was supported and made possible from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, also known as PCORI, um, with also additional support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And um, just wanna quickly define PCOR and CER. You're gonna hear a lot about that today, but basically it's research that's looking at two or more um, healthcare outcomes or options that are meaningful to patients and families. Um, so that's what we mean when we talk about PCOR and CER. So, you know, the Next Society has been around for a few years now, and we've done a few research projects here and there. And what we've noticed over the last you know, few years is that there's so many different directions that we could dedicate the limited resources and time and um, team members that we have. And what we wanted to do was identify what are the most urgent and impactful questions, not just to perhaps the people that are leading the Next Society, but a really much broader and diverse team that are um, representative and core stakeholders in the NEC community. And that's really what um, launched kind of the interest in um, why we're here today around this project. This was our third PCORI award that we received. Um, the other two were in support of our conferences, the NEC Symposium at UC Davis and the NEC Symposium at the University of Michigan. So we're really grateful to PCORI for really helping to um, springboard our work and help us to um, really transform the work that we're doing. 
And some of the project aims that we had really focused on building our team. So bringing together our patient families who've been personally affected by NAC, the clinicians and the researchers who have dedicated their entire careers to this disease and get them working together in a way that can advance research. I also want to um, specify that this was uh, not a research award from PCORI, it was in, an engagement award. So it's really a capacity building award to get us get the next society in our community ready to advance that research. Um, and so that's kind of, I just want to emphasize that. Um, and determine the research priorities, which we're going to share with you today, and also to establish a model framework so that other rare disease communities and other groups in the neonatal community can help um, their own populations and learn from our experience and, and the lessons that either worked really well for us or did not work really well and um, help others learn from what we went through with this experience. So here's a quick timeline. We've been working on this for a while. We actually designed this project before the pandemic and the pandemic really disrupted things because we had planned to have a lot of in-person time together and team building activities that were going to be taking place in person. None of that happened. So we really had to redesign the project and um, kind of go back to the drawing board. But I think we did it in a way that was meaningful and that you're gonna hear more about in a moment. And um, we went through the recruitment, the project kicked off, kick off, the kind of the redesign for COVID, identifying these broad topics, prioritizing those uh, more specific topics, and then the final list, which you'll hear about in a moment. We worked really hard to be as representative of our community as possible. It's not perfect, but we were very intentional with who we invited to serve on this kind of core leadership team. So we um, had half of the team was patient families who had a personal experience with NAC, and then the other half was clinicians and researchers who have, again, dedicated their careers to studying and to um, improving outcomes for this disease. And we had uh, 22 team members. We did have some challenges with the pandemic in terms of families needing to um, reprioritize what their commitments are. And so we, we did um, have a couple families drop off and then we were able to bring on a couple more. So um, overall, we worked really hard to make sure that we had a diverse um, uh, team of perspectives, life experiences and skills represented on our PCOR leadership team. And we really, oops, sorry about that. We worked hard to um, invest in our team. And so rather than just bringing everyone together to do the work, we really wanted to um, cultivate a sense of rapport and trust and connection with our team so that we could you know, do this work long-term and to have a cohesive team that really um, could operate and collaborate um, on a higher level together. And so we did that by um, having some really fun virtual <laughs> team building exercises investing in that time. We also went through um, a training called the PCORI Research Fundamentals. I believe my colleague Erin is sharing that link in the chat box if you're interested in checking that out. Um, really um, important training for our team. And so if you um, are interested, I really encourage you to check out PCORI Research Fundamentals training. We had a number of learning sessions where we brought in other um, stakeholders and other researchers and just perspectives in the community that we could learn from as a team. And then finally, we um, had our all-in strategies that we worked to implement throughout this process. And I believe my colleague Erin is uh, sharing that link in the chat box, but this is something that we developed after the next symposium in 2019 um, to provide people with um, strategies that help everyone um, at the table feel included, feel heard, feel valued. Uh, and so we worked really hard to make all of those things happen in, in this leadership team. And here was the one in-person meeting we were able to have together before the pandemic quickly shut it all down. So we kicked off the project in February of 2020 um, in Sacramento. It was an amazing time for us to do some team building and some initial um, brainstorming of how we were gonna move this work forward. And then it quickly all moved virtual thanks to the pandemic. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Ravi now to um, share a little bit more about the process that we went through and where we're going from here. Well, thanks, Jen, and uh, it's it's uh, I'm really excited to be here and share a little bit about how we got to the the point at which we could we could um, begin prioritization. And the, the first step was really to look in in two lenses. The first was what are the topics that have been studied that are already out there, and and, and that was through searching um, the literature and other sources, and then also reaching out to the community to get the input from our broader community about topics that need to be studied. And combining both of these, and the goal was to generate a list of topics that then could go through, we'll talk about this, the rounds to then 
develop what were the, the key priorities of which many of these were very important topics. So I think we, we realized early on that all of the topics that we had found, many of these were really important, um, but what we were trying to find is, is kind of a shared vision for what were the top priorities that were common amongst clinicians and researchers and patients and families. We reached out and, and some of you may have participated in this, so thank you for doing that. Um, a broad survey of the community to try to hear from you about what were the topics and questions that are most important to you. And part of this informed our selection of the topics that were then went through formal prioritization. And what we ended up doing is we took the input we received from you through a survey. Um, and from that, we received kind of 10 themes that were, that were tied to topics. We also did a review of the literature and went through a large uh, number of studies in the field and, and categorized those into areas of, of um, focus. And, and that was by reviewing a little over 1700 articles. And then we also had the opportunity to reach out and, and um, Aaron Umberger and Lindsey Green did this where they looked at, at really going through what was out there in blogs and social media posts and stories by patients and families that, that I think are very impactful and the questions and, and areas that, of uncertainty that they raised. And we took all of this and we started with trying to be broad and, and having a list of about 157 potential topics, which of course was, was too large to really prioritize. And so from that 157 list, we went through really to be intentional through several rounds of trying to consolidate similarly um, similar topics into, into groups to where we had a final list of 32 topics that then went to our, our PCOR team for prioritization. Now it's important to say this, this process was really focused on patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research. And so from that, that list, the final list of 32 topics, we had two goals in the first round of prioritization. We used a, a modified Delphi process for this. The first was to try to separate out those topics that could be very important, but that were not related to patient-centered outcomes research or competitive effectiveness research. And that was partly important and facilitated by our training of our team in terms of what, what constitutes PCOR and CER. And then within those topics that were PCOR and CER to, to choose and select the top 20 prioritized topics. And this was done using a Likert scale of ranking um, using a scale um, ranging from one to 10 of, of kind of the, the lowest priority to the highest priority of topics. And so from round one, we, we ended up with 20 uh, topics. And, and then for round two, we moved to try to get that list, go through some of the feedback that our team had regarding some of the topics and some of the questions and some of the discussions we had around that. We went through a second round of ranking. And we also asked our team to, to go through and rank each of the scores, uh, each of the topics through a score of, of one to 10, but also to then choose and pick the top four priority topics of, of the list of 20. What were the top four most important topics? And I think this allowed us to look at, at different ways in which um, people might prioritize topics and, and, and to see um, if these were both consistent. And so from this, we ended up with an overall list of 20 top priorities as, as they were ranked in order of, of their scales. It's important that there were very, our team was intentional and diverse perspectives. And so we also wanted to separate out this list while we had a shared vision amongst our entire team of, of kind of overall priorities. We also created lists that were the top priorities from patient families and also the top priorities from clinician researchers. Although for today, we're gonna to focus on, on the overall priority prioritized list. When we, when we uh, publish this, we'll be sharing um, all of these. because so I think they do, they are informative in terms of understanding how these priorities um, differ by, um, by different perspectives and different stakeholders. So we're, we're looking forward to sharing, sharing these priorities shortly, but we'd, we'd like to bring in our panel and, and, um, and really get some experience of kind of what their experience was like during this prioritization process how did it go and, and what would they like to share about to the broader community about their own experience and what might others learn from, the, from this work? And so we'll be calling on our panelists and, and asking them to briefly introduce themselves. And so I'd like Lindsay, maybe for you to start and you know, tell us how, how, how this was for you and, and what you'd like others to learn from this. 
Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Green. I am the Next Society's Outreach Coordinator, and I am based in London. Uh, I was a full-term baby, but I had surgical neck in 1997 that left me with long-term complications. And so I represented the patient voice and perspective on our PCOR project. I will admit that the process was challenging and confusing, and the PCORI research fundamentals were essential when it came to my ability to feel more confident when I entered that space and my ability to keep up. Um, and I think I'm the only person on this panel, uh, I think I'm the person on this panel rather that had the, the least amount of experience when it came to medicine um, as they have a much more creative background. Or maybe it's that I have the least amount of experience when it comes to having some kind of agency in medicine and simply being heard. You see, I've been, a, I've been a patient my whole life, but never, especially when it comes to my neck-related complications, am I treated like I have any authority or credibility over my body story. And the power dynamic is the pinnacle of disempowerment. It tells me that I'm full of nonsense. It begs me to stop talking. And so suddenly I'm going from having anxiety attacks before appointments to being told that these clinicians are supposed to be my peers. And I'm not only asked to share my perspective, I'm told it is necessary. And I had a lot of imposter syndrome and I had to come to terms with the fact that in interactions with doctors, my instinct is to protect myself. So processing the rule of equity in this space was more challenging than learning how to do the task at hand. And I had to remind myself of the things that I'd been denied as a patient my whole life. I am smart and capable. As someone who has had neck, the knowledge that comes from my body is valuable and irreplaceable. And so on our first day back in November 2019, we were shown a chart demonstrating how different stakeholders have different priorities, doctors, nurses, researchers, patients, and families. And if this research concerns all of us, but only one group is present, think of the difference that makes in what we'll find and think about what we may miss out on. And that's why for me, a big highlight of this process was going through every patient and family story that's been shared with us, really paying attention to the questions and concerns they expressed. And that was given just as much consideration and weight as the literature that we reviewed, which was really special. And so I'd like people to know that there are some things that you'll just never know without a patient being in the room. And there are some questions you'll never even know to ask. In this space, rather than being seen as passive, I was a collaborator. So I'd like everyone right now to ask themselves why, be it in the hospital or practice or a research team, the relationship between patients and clinicians isn't an inherently collaborative one. What parts of our culture do we need to change so that patient empowerment and inclusion aren't seen as revolutionary or unique? What do we need to do to transform patients into people who are worth listening to when it comes to our own bodies? So thank you. Amazing, Lindsay. We're really grateful to have you on this team. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Lindsay. That was that was really uh, important and, and really highlights what what uh, the, the uniqueness of our team and in, in capturing and, and really working as partners in this process. And I'd love to hear from Maz and, and get your thoughts about about this. Hi. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, my name is Maz. Um, I am the chair of NEC UK charity. Um, but I am also the mum to uh, Freddie, who developed um, neck at 29 weeks, and he lives with the long-term complications of neck. So he has short bowel syndrome um, and cerebral palsy and, and other issues as a result. So I was part of this team from a patient family perspective. Um, participating in this project was a real privilege. Um, it, as Lindsay said, it was really empowering to be surrounded by so many people who share the same goal, um, which obviously is a world without neck. Um, I think the thing that always stands out to me when working with the Neck Society, again, like Lindsay has said, but particularly in this project, is that patients and patient families are truly at the centre of everything. Um, that they do because the reality is that the largest impacts neck has is, is always going to be on, on the patients and the families and, and the reason the clinicians are doing the work that they do is, is to, to ensure that 
we get the best outcomes. Um, so being part of this project was was brilliant because and, and like Lindsay said, it, it shouldn't be revolutionary that actually the patient voice and the parent voice is is as important as the clinicians. And I genuinely can say at, at every meeting, if if we disagreed or if you know we we had a different opinion, ev- everyone's was was equal and was listened to. And actually, it was really insightful to see you know on both sides there are things that actually clinicians or researchers said, and we still thought actually. Yeah, that re- is really important. <laughs> it is really important. Whereas we're thinking about it from, you know, our child or, or particularly if, if you're, I think it, if you you're thinking it from your own perspective, and I think that's all we can all do. But whether we're a bereaved family or whether we're living with the long term complications of neck, I think it was really great to kind of take that step back and going through each individual topic to think, okay, this isn't my story, but actually I've heard so many times through the charity, this question comes up so many times and actually then going through and going, right, okay, this is important to all of us. Um, what can others learn from this experience? I, I, I think times are changing um, here in the UK and it's really, lovely whenever I get involved in research projects here I I always talk about the work that's done in the next society um, because it always put patients first and I think that's so important from dedicating every every meeting to to a child just brings it back to where it should be so please 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 involve patients involve families um, and yeah it's it's been absolutely a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you, Naz. We're so grateful to have you. Do we, we, you want to share next? Yeah. Why don't we? Uh, thank you, Maz. Um, and maybe we can hear from from Toby. Thank you. My name is Toby Yanowitz. I am a neonatologist and a clinical researcher at the University of Pittsburgh um, Children's Hospital and our delivery room hospital too. And I was asked to join in this um, collaborative because of the work that I do with the Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium, where I am the head of our uh, neck focus group. Um, So I already hadn't came into this with an experience of working with um, investigators from all over the country. Um, But I have to say, this was so eye-opening to me working with patient families. And um, we're just gonna tell you some of the reasons I love that. And um, it really, I feel like this whole process um, changed me as a researcher. I no longer feel like I work in my own little bubble where I'm like, all we think about is what what causes neck and how are we going to figure that out? But, you know, broaden my perspective to all the issues related to neck and especially, um, I would say, even the long-term um, implications. We as neonatologists, clinically, we take care of babies. And then if they survive, we send them home. And there are some families that you bond with that you hear about you hear from them, you know, with a Christmas card every now or then, but to really get to know some of the families and see the impact that neck has on the health of the child long-term to talk to survivors and how they've um, dealt with this over their lifespan. It was really eye-opening to me that, you know, this is really a lifelong disorder, not just a neonatal disease. Um, I love the whole setup of the meetings, how we started each session. You saw the picture embarrassingly of me with some other people, but we did fun, uh, interactive, get to know each other icebreaker activities at the beginning of every session. I felt like I was in like first grade again. And, but it really helped you get to know each other as a person. Um, I know I've said this to Jen before, but, I know some of the 
patients and families came into this feeling intimidated by the doctors. But I have to tell you that we were just as intimidated by you, um, especially somebody like Jen, who's so strong and such a passionate person who's really going to get things done for this disease that she cares so strongly about. I, I feel like I, I hope that I incorporated some of that passion just by working with her. And to me, it was, it was a little intimidating at first. So these icebreakers work both ways. They were great for the families to get to know that clinicians and doctors are people also, but I think they were also good for the doctors to know that we're really all on the same page and we really can work together. Because then when we had our, our meeting part of the meeting, um, it was true. We were all on the same ground and it made me, I think, be more open to other people's perspectives and rather than just like the science. Um, so yeah, so I thought um, this was a great process. I hope that our priorities that you'll hear about really will go somewhere, that it will help change the face of research for this rare disease that, you know, touches all of our lives. But um, I really want to thank Jen for inviting me to do this because I really feel like it did um, broaden my perspective with respect to neck research and also just improve my abilities as a clinician as well. So thank you. Amazing, Toby. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to highlight how Toby really, I think, embodies what we all brought to this team is our vulnerability. And I think it's obvious that, you know, for the patient families, it is we are vulnerable coming into this space. But it, like Toby said, it wasn't just us kind of opening ourselves to this experience into this process, but the clinicians, like she said, are human too and have these different feelings and experiences. And so for us to kind of um, check our like check our egos, check our vulnerability at the door, and walk into this space um, and really open our minds to a different experience was really powerful for all of us. So thank you, Toby, for really contributing to that culture that we were able to build together. Um, so grateful to have you as part of this team and to continue our collaboration together. Jay, excited to hear from you. Yeah, would love to share. So I'm Jay Kim. I'm a neonatologist and pediatric gastroenterologist. I've had a longstanding history with NEC, uh, both doing basic research and clinical research to try to get rid of this disease. And so this, uh, and involvement with the NEC Society. And this process was interesting, just to one, be able to have uh, the, the funding uh, through the PCORI and, and Chan Zuckerberg to get um, a group of physicians and patient families together. I think that was very novel. It's, it was a, my first encounter of being able to do that. And I and like Toby, it was uh, a newer process to be able to be in a in a, a group to come up with some very focused um, ideas, but to do it collaboratively to be able to have um, a different way of communicating, which I, I had always checked myself to say, you know, that the room is bigger than the rooms that we normally uh, work in that the communication space is going to be different and that every voice needed to be heard. And I think the, the one kickoff that was the in-person kickoff, I had really fond memories of that because it was a time of sharing stories and really connecting with each other because of all of our individual uh, involvement, whether we're a survivor like Lindsay or we had you know, deep um, losses or uh, seeing patients that really, really had some terrible things happen to them. Uh, so I have real fond memories that, and I wonder how wonderful the process could have been even greater had we it, had not had this darn uh, pandemic. Um, so I think the the process of, of being together and communicating in a different way was very uh, instructive for me. It kind of gave me a different way of thinking. And, and I've taken some of that and how I, I deal with uh, patient families um, going forward. Um, the, the one thing that I also thought was great is this idea that we as a, an exercise and a great thing about this is just bringing agnostically people together that, have, that are stakeholders that wanna get uh, something done about a disease. But being able to look at the literature, take a step back, and catalog, as Ravi had said, 
and say like, where have we been? Where have we focused all our energy on? And, and what was clear was just a lot of work done in some areas and really little done in other areas. And some topics that came up in our uh, discussion that were completely not even on the map. I mean, really, really, particularly around the long-term survivors and just really just uh, gave a sense of, okay, this is what we've done as a community, as a research community, but maybe we need to take that step back and now bring those patient family voices and really sort of uh, look at the different perspectives. I, I, I remember part of the process, it was clear there were a lot of things that we resonated as a group, that there were topics that we all kind of wanted to have medications and therapies to manage and diagnose uh, neck, but there were other things that separated us as the two, two groups, which I thought was also very uh, interesting. Some that we prioritize as physicians higher, and, and it was the inverse in, in some respect in the short list um, with the patient family voices. Um, so I think that that's one of those things where you negotiate and say, well, what are we willing to give up? Because that trimming and heavy, heavy pruning was painful uh, from my end, because you know, there are certain topics that you really, really want to be up there. Uh, but it, but it was a it was a great process for just being able to uh, understand each other's perspectives and then ultimately whittle down uh, whittle down that list. So all in all, I think one of the take homes is wouldn't this be a great process for us to do across all the targets uh, that we're looking at in terms of problem diseases, problem conditions? We don't do enough of this. We don't do it at all practically where one, we ag agnostically come together as a community, not as individual investigators uh, or in siloed institutions, um, but also not doing it together with patient families uh, from the start and really kind of take tackling the, the beast uh, with a much stronger and more broader strategy, which I think is, would be so valuable for so many other conditions as well. So really great uh, process to be involved in. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, there, there are so many topics that are important. They can be very personal to us. They might be areas that either our, our patients or families experienced or, or maybe areas that some of our clinician researchers study. And, and I, I wonder if you could share a little bit of your experience of how do you balance that Kind of what might be important in a very personal level with what is kind of the shared priorities of the group and kind of the experience on that. I wonder if if, uh, if our, our 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 team could kind of talk a little bit about that. And, and maybe Lindsay, do you do you want to start with that? Yeah. So I think one thing that um, I definitely had to do was, and I think probably everyone, you know, you walk into this space and you have these biases, right? You have the um, issues that may be most pertinent to maybe you personally or one of the ones that you're most interested in, but then you have to kind of take a step back, check your biases, and then um, as Maz was saying earlier, you know, really consider what is helpful for the entire community, right? And not just for you or, you know, your own personal interests, but for everyone. And uh, yeah, checking the bias, checking your bias is, is huge. Uh, that was it. That was a big challenge, but that was vital, I think, for this to work. Do, do others have thoughts on that, that uh, the challenge? Uh, Robbie, Toby, I, I really was going to say something almost exactly what Lindsay said is, you know, um, you come in with to this process thinking that you know what the priorities are going to be. You're so convinced that you have the best priorities in your head and sort of just being open to hearing from other people. And then you start to rethink it. And during the whole process, you're constantly reevaluating and rethinking where things go. And I was sitting here smiling, listening to uh, Jay talk, because um, if, if I can take one second, it just reminded me a little bit of when my older daughter was born 16 years ago, my husband and I couldn't agree on a name. So we each made a list of our top four. I made my top four and he made his top four. And then we were going to compare them. And I was absolutely 100% convinced that he was going to have the same first choice that I had, and that was going to be our daughter's name. 
Well, my first choice was his fourth choice and his first choice was my fourth choice. So we went into the delivery room with the two middle choices and we still couldn't decide. So one morning I just woke up and said, she told me her name's Rebecca, sorry. <laughs> but um, it, it just, this whole process to remind me of the same thing. I was so convinced, so convinced that my priorities would be other people's priorities. And you really have to kind of, you know, see the broader picture and see what's important to the whole community and not just what you, from your little limited experiences, think is important. Well, thank you so much for those perspectives. And uh, I, I think we're going to kind of move on and actually share what we came up with in our priorities. And then we'll, and then we'll bring um, everybody uh, back again to kind of discuss where we go here. So th thank you. That was great. Um, and uh, you can participate in the panel. So I'm, I'm going to, we're going to do a reveal. I, I didn't mention, I, I wanted to highlight before in terms of our methodology, we, we really did try to look at other groups that have pursued this and we valued some of our uh, input. One, one of our advisors is Chris Gale, who, who shared some of the work he had done with the James Lind Alliance in the UK, as well as what's in the US, um, the Board Research Network had done in terms of approaches to prioritization to try to take approaches that have been done and then and then to really take the input of our team to, to modify what worked best for us. And so I'm going to um, share what we came up with. We're going to focus on the first six, uh, the top six of our priorities. But when we when we publish this, you'll, you'll see the, the full list of 20 including the list by patient families and by clinician researchers. But these are the top six ranked priorities amongst the whole group. So number six was uh, research into the topic of long-term gastrointestinal outcomes. Number five was patient family engagement as it relates to either Timeliness of diagnosis of NEC or other aspects in the caring of infants with NEC. Number four was research into acute management of NEC. Number three was tools for diagnosing NEC. Number two is research into human milk and lactation support as it relates to NEC. And the top research priority was medications and treatments to prevent NEC. And, and these were really the, the, the top six. And um, what I'm gonna share now is kind of how this actually came out in terms of how we quantified this. So what we looked at really uh, of interest, and I think it's a highlight maybe for our, our own experience and some of what you heard was that really for any of these individual topics, Individuals within the team had a broad range of, of rankings. And so for we, we used the range of one to 10. And so each member of, of our team, the patients and families and clinicians and researchers for each of the 20 topics that they scored in the second round, they assigned a score of one to 10. And what you see here in the column is, is the rankings of these top six topics by the average score and, um, and for the top six topics, these range from 7.6 to 8.6. But even within any of the given topics, I, I think this highlights the, the importance of bringing diverse perspectives because for even the top topic, you can see the range of rankings in terms of importance across our team range from three to 10. And um, so for all of these topics, individuals rank them, rank them differently. But when we actually as a collective came together, through both of our rounds, we were relatively consistent in what were the top six priorities. And, and these really matched up with among the 20 topics when we asked our team to choose what were the four most important priorities. These four most important priorities were the same as what ranked up. So these top four that you see matched up with when people had to pick, if you had to pick the four most important topics to you, Granted, these are all important areas of research. The top four were the ones that, that matched up. And so these were areas that were important to both clinicians and researchers and patients and families. And I think this, when we, in these top six really highlighted where there was a shared vision of, of, of priorities. And as we got further down the list beyond from seven to 20, there was a lot more variability and also differences between what patients and families and clinicians and researchers um, valued. So the first one is development and use of medications, such as either novel new medications or existing 
uh, medications or treatments to prevent NEC. Number two is uh, topics in research into optimization of human milk, including factors such as mother's own milk, daughter milk, fresh versus frozen human milk, colostrum or components such as oligosaccharides. And I think one of the things we added was the importance of lactation tied to that for the prevention of NEC. Number three was tools such as clinical scoring, biomarkers, or imaging for the diagnosis of NEC. Number four is the acute medical treatment and management of the neck, including novel treatments, biomarkers, imaging, antibiotic approaches, reintroduction of feeding, nursing care, and treatment of pain, as well as avoiding brain injury. And so it's really the broad aspects of how we can better treat and manage infants who develop NEC. Number five was patient family engagement, empowerment, and integration for the NICU care team, including the role of parents and the partnership that they might have with clinicians in, in the timeliness of neck diagnosis. And this was one that really shone through in terms of really a, a high level of importance of families saying, you know, we're at the bedside all the time. We can, uh, we heard stories of families saying, I knew something was wrong, um, that something had changed. And how can we, as clinicians, take it, you know, use that and part of the families to use that information for, for timeliness of neck diagnosis. And then number six was long-term gastrointestinal outcomes, including short bowel and other non-neurodevelopmental health outcomes from NEC that include related quality of life measures. And I think this is one area, as Jay mentioned, that really, really hasn't been on, on the radar of our, our research community and, and was an area that was a significant priority um, that came, came through. Now, I, I wanted to share as we get through these topics, and we really focused and our team focused on prioritizing topics, but each of these topics have questions. And these are um, some questions that, that came out of, from our teams about, as they relate to these topics, what were the questions that were here? And there were a number of them, so I've just highlighted a snapshot of, of some of these. And so for long-term gastrointestinal outcomes, one of the questions was, what percent of next survivors have long-term gastrointestinal problems and how does this affect their quality of life? For patient family engagement, one of the questions was, can neck be diagnosed earlier or even prevented altogether when parents are informed and integrated as a partner in care? Regarding party number four, rank number four the, on acute management of NEC, the question was, does cooling treatment during during the neck phase prevent brain injury in infants who have NEC. Regarding number three, uh, tools for diagnosing NEC, one of the questions was what is more reliable for diagnosing NEC, ultrasound or x-ray? Regarding human milk and lactation support, one of the questions was does fresh mother's milk provide more protection against NEC than frozen mother's milk? And for number one, which was medications and treatments to prevent NEC, one of the, the questions was which probiotic provides the most protection against NEC? So I think these are, these are as we move from the topics to, to the questions that, um, of, of which there were, there were many within these topics, this is, I hope gives an idea of the types of questions our teams were thinking about as it relates to these topics. And you know, there were a number of lessons that, that we learned as part of this experience um, and this effort. And, and I wanted to um, bring Jen, Jen in here to, to kind of touch on some of these. Thanks, Ravi, for providing that overview. And I really appreciate all the comments in the chat box. Thank you. And we are delighted to hear that you all find this list to be powerful and, and useful and exciting, because we do too. So um, a few key takeaway points that we really want to emphasize. The first one, it's just how important the team building process was for us to be able to effectively work together um, and to kind of get over those power dynamics and to collaborate in a really meaningful way in this shared learning effort. And so we actually brought in a group called Third Plateau to really help us um, to develop that trust and rapport and to take time to, um, to get to know each other on a human to human level. And then that way we could go through these learning experiences together um, like the PCORI research fundamentals and the various learning sessions, it was really important to recognize that we were learning together and that despite um, the different experiences that we brought to this team, and some of us may have operated on dozens of infants with neck while others may have lost their child to this disease, they are all equally valuable and not one experience is, is, um, is better or worse than the other. And just recognizing um, 
the the time that we needed to dedicate to that team building and to the rapport um, was really critical. Um, it was also something that we discovered around um, as we ranked these priorities and we went through these research questions, some of our families, especially our bereaved families, found it to be really difficult and painful. And I'll just say as a bereaved mother myself, this work is painful. Um, it is it, it hurts to work on a disease that took my child's life. And yet I am compelled, just like Erin Umberger and a lot of the other families that are here today, we are compelled to do this because we see how we can improve outcomes for other families. And despite that um, satisfaction and that um, comfort that we get as we help other families, it still can be re-traumatizing for patients and for families to go through this work that is so directly related to um, the traumatic loss of their child or whatever it is that experience that they had in the NICU. And so just recognizing that and building um, more intentional processes and structures around that so that we can better support families, we can anticipate um, how and when things might be difficult and really set up a more uh, supportive environment that we are always working to do, but um, just being more mindful. And so that's something that we've learned um, to hopefully do better um, now that we have become aware of this, um, of this issue and this problem, especially for bereaved families. So thanks for the opportunity to share that, Robbie. I'll let you take the last two. Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, you know, one of the things that we start before we actually went into the process of ranking, one of the things we had a lot of discussions about is how, how to move, you know, should we focus on topics and if and related to topics, how granular should we be? And, and also whether to be, um, whether to have really very specific research questions. And, and as part of those discussions, what we felt was that, you know, even within a specific research question, there could be a really wide range of different types of studies that could be done to answer those questions. And it felt like that was just a little too hard for the group to, to try to get around, um, around kind of very specific questions that might involve a lot of detail. And, and so we took a step back and, and really decided, you know, topics was where I think our, our team felt it was just easier to con consider and, and to, to then um, internalize in terms of prioritization. We also looked at what, what was the level of granularity in terms of when we first started and when we began, the, when we began and came up with a list of over, over 100 topics. And really we started with the desire to be very granular and to look at the literature and try to get as in terms of granular areas of, of research. But over time, it really, to make this functional, we went through the process of taking those granular areas of research and, and combining them into the topics that, um, some of the topics that you see. And so when you, when you saw when I presented that list about, for example, tools for the diagnosis of NEC, and, and some of those might be imaging modalities or biomarkers, you know, each of those were individual areas, um, the specific areas that, that got combined as we went through the prioritization process. And I think for our families that the topics really felt um, the way in which they could really prioritize and, and that the questions we hope will emerge from these. Um, the second lesson that we learned was really about rankings and, and the approach to rankings. And we had a lot of discussions about what's the right approach? Should we be scoring these, these were all, you know, one of the, the things was these were all important topics. These are all areas that we need research and yet we, we really need to come up with a shared vision for priorities. And so we realized for any given priority, there was really a wide range of rankings amongst our team, but that for the top, particularly the top four priorities and, 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 and then the top six, that there was really a consensus in those top six amongst the clinician researchers and the patient families, although maybe the ordering amongst those six are, you know, differed slightly um, between patient families and clinician researchers. And also to highlight that, that you know, the, the, the separation in those, those top six priorities were, were relatively small. And so what might be ranked as a number three in terms of the prioritized agenda or four really were very similar in terms of importance to our team and really to think of it as these were these top four to six priorities were really separated out from the rest of the, the research topics that we uh, that we looked at and, and one of the things that we did after in this after the first round and I saw a question about what what changed between the first and the second round what in the first round when when our team had a chance to to rank each of these topics on a Likert scale we also had the opportunity for them to provide comments 
And when we looked at all the results from the first round, we also had discussions around what the comments had from our team and, and, and how they viewed space topics. And that information then was involved in terms of um, moving forward in that second round that might've led to some of the changes in terms of the rankings. And we also used a, a kind of a, a, a choose for approach to try to have a different, um, some of our team members found it difficult to give a numerical ranking to these priorities. And so as a different way, we, we had kind of the choose your top four of the list of 20 and, and both were very congruent. And, and so that's, I think, something that we learned is, is different people might, um, that different approaches for prioritization might be helpful to employ. Awesome. So Jen, I'm going to turn Everyone it back over to you. Thank you. Yeah, if everyone can turn their camera on, that would be great. So we'd like to hear from our team of what you hope happens next. And we'll start with Lindsay. And if Thank you want you. to take the slides away, Ravi, that would be great. So I think it's obvious that we want those research priorities that we found to be promoted and tackled. But what I also want us to do is to learn from the collaborative process itself. So I'd like patients, families, and clinicians to do an honest reflection about how they felt about working with others in that space, how they felt about their own comfort and empowerment, what they observed about the dynamic going on. And I still noticed that overall patient and family, patients and families were often quieter. And I, I cannot speak for everyone else, but for me, it was because I still felt kind of intimidated. I still sometimes didn't know if I'd have anything useful to add. And as Jennifer said, there was a lot of emotional labor um, that was there as well. So there was a different demand, an added demand for families. So for future collaborations like this one, I'd like to see more training and empowerment sessions to help patients and families to enter this kind of space. And there should also be sessions for clinicians on collaborating with patients and families. And I'd like us to pay closer attention to this so we can continue to improve upon what we've already discovered. Um, I would also like to see more patients involved going forward. My parents and I have different priorities when it comes to my health and all are important but different. So we really need both patients and families represented. Amazing. You stated, Lindsay. I couldn't agree more. Naz, what, what do you hope happens next? Yeah, you stole mine. No, <laughs> um, mine's very similar. Um, obviously, I hope that the work starts to answering um, what obviously we've all decided are very important questions. Um, but mostly, I hope that we can collaborate with all stakeholders. Um, to create valid and meaningful research. Um, and I hope that we find some answers for our children and for our families. And I think the only way that we're going to do that is having more, more projects like this, you know, having more people engaged and, and open to, to this kind of process to allow us to move forward um, with that research. So. I'm sad it's over, but really hopeful that we can kind of move forward because this is just the beginning, really. Absolutely. And I, um, I will share this in a moment, but we are, everyone that was involved in this leadership team to do these priorities, we're redirecting to other parts of the organization. So Maz, for example, is now serving on our patient and family advisory council. And Lindsay has never is not she's an employee of the next society, so we we get to keep her too. So we are working hard to make sure that truly this is just the beginning, and we're going to keep that team growing and expanding and continuing to nurture those um, relationships and connections that we form during this team um, moving forward. So thank you so much for that, Toby. Yeah, thank you. So um, as a researcher going forward from this experience, I think that. Um, it's easy to say, oh, they chose a priority. That's something I want to study and just go study it in your own little vacuum again. But to sort of keep in mind what got us to this point and try to continue the, the patient engagement going forward. Um, we talked about this locally a little bit about our having, um, there's like family 
um, groups associated with the NICUs and one of my NICUs, it kind of fell away, but making sure like encouraging them to restart up that family group and having, um, you know, at the beginning of thinking of studies and how you're going to do them to maybe engage some of those local families who have expressed an interest in being involved in not just the clinical care, but also maybe research and um, but the other thing I was thinking is, you know, PCORI's great. PCORI funded this project, but they're the only ones I know who fund this type of research, and that's one institution. All the other institutions that fund research fund mechanistic and, you know, non-patient centered research. And is there a way to even, you know, improve the scope by having other funding mechanisms maybe you know smaller projects that will fund family centered research um, so that this becomes you know not just one little niche of research but like a larger part of research as a whole absolutely can we do more thank you Toby Jay yeah I would uh, reiterate what Lindsay started off with, and that is let's put a light to this process and as much as we can so that people in our field, but certainly beyond, can kind of appreciate the value of the process. Uh, so that's one thing. I think there's there's a lot to learn, and I think there's um, broad applicability. Um, pragmatically, this is as uh, was mentioned, this is the beginning uh, that Maz had said. And, and what does that mean? It means that what are we going to do with this list now that it sort of either um, validates that yes, if, uh, that certain of these resonated with uh, different researchers in the field, but then what do we do with that? How does that make it into either stimulate collaboration? So taking an idea and saying, hey, let's this, who else is in this priority area? and bringing those communities together, those researchers and families together around that particular topic. And what's the advocacy of this list? If you're a researcher and you, you want to get more funding, does this list help to uh, bring out new calls for uh, new funding opportunities in, in NEC research? Um, I certainly think th this is an activating time now, to, now that there's been a lot of process to get to this short list. How can we take the short list to uh, energize people to collaborate and people to find more money? Because really, ultimately, this stuff won't get happen unless we identify new sources of funding. Um, and, and I think that's that's what I'm hoping that the work now begins. How do we do those? How do we get the collaboration and activation for, for new funding? Absolutely, Jim. Thank you. Ravi, do you have anything you want to yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, some of these six, you know, top priorities. Some have been, you know, and we did this when we went through the process of sharing what's been studied out there and quantifying the number of studies as it related to some of these topics. You know, some have had a large number of studies. For example, approaches to prevention of NEC. Although I think, you know, we still agreed that this was still really important. But there's other areas. For example number five and number six in terms of patient family engagement and NEC and long-term gastrointestinal outcomes and NEC that really haven't had um, as much research. And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how do we balance these in terms of, of areas that have really been understudied versus areas that are that might have been studied a lot but still um, you know, came, came out as, as those that were of highest priority amongst our team. I can start. I think the I would say that for those areas that are already strong, in other words, we're doing a lot of research in that area, and it's one of our top two priorities on this list. I, I actually think that that could be taken as an advantage to say that, look, to funding agencies, that this is absolutely still valid to continue to do additional research in this and to continue to, to grow uh, new endeavors, particularly around on treatment, for instance, and, and biomarkers. So I think that's good. It's a di different equation when you're looking at a completely untouched area of, of long-term outcomes. That requires a, a it, it's now you say, how do you build that community of, of researchers that one, think it's important and be able to build um, the architecture around the, the, the collaborative um, research groups.
I think this was one of the concerns that we sort of discussed was, <clears throat> were we going to find some topics that were really important, but actually no one's touched because it's really hard. Um, and, and that was kind of one of my big things moving moving through this process was okay actually everyone's decided this is really important now how do we get how do we get answers and I think that was really important with the long-term outcomes it, both the ones that factored in the top six and the ones that were further down because actually for me personally obviously having a, a child who has long-term outcomes and then seeing that actually there's still so little done how do we go about getting people involved in doing that and again how do we get funding because actually everyone says well actually how do we do this it's 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 too hard so yeah I, th I think that's really important but I'm, I'm not really sure how do we do that how do we get people um, and I think collaboration is going to be the only way and I think probably it needs to be on a global scale because neck is rare and then long-term complications are rarer again um, so yeah, I, th I think that's that's so important. I think a big challenge for um, questions like number six, it's not just a question of, you know, how do we get funding for something like that? It's also, how do we get people to even know it's a problem <laughs> or that it exists in the first place? Um, so, I mean, first of all, NECA is something that not a lot of people know about, um, but those of us who do at least know, okay, yeah, prevention, that's a huge issue. But a lot of people don't even know that there's such a thing as having long-term outcomes. So I think awareness is probably the first step with some of those lesser known ones on the list. You know, along those lines, I was also thinking, you know, we're talking about now we're in the process of writing this up and we're gonna submit this for publication, which to me means we're submitting it to a medical journal to be published. But how do we let the lay populace know that we involved families in this and families can be engaged and because not everybody reads medical literature how do we get this out there to the broader community that because everybody's a patient for something whether it's neck or another disease everybody's got something how do we let people know and families know that they can get involved in these type of processes and where do we look to, you know, publish our results in a non-medical journal so that the world knows that we've done this, not just the medical community? Thank you so much. And we totally agree. So um, I would love to answer that question and just share like what our plans are and if there's ideas of what else we could do. So first, we're going to advocate to make sure uh, to the best that we can, that this is an open access article, at least for a period of time. So our patient and family community can access it and they are not just hitting a paywall. Um, but next, we have those videos um, that Erin Umberger shared earlier. She may be able to share that link in the chat box. So we have videos that kind of provide a really um, broad and brief overview of the process and of the work that we did. And then we're also working to build a model framework that's going to really, it's going to be a PDF document that lives on our website that can be downloaded by anyone that um, provides an overview of what we did, how we did it, and what others can do and learn from it and take forward. And um, so that will be another accessible way that we provide this information to others. But by all means, if you have ideas and suggestions, we'd love to do more. We know we need to do more. So we'd love to hear from anyone else. And while we're, you know, while we have a bit of a moment, thanks, Erin, for putting that in the chat box. Um, I see the comments around reaching out to um, people who work with short kids and adults who have short bowel syndrome or other complications of neck. And I want to say two things that Lindsay has helped us to understand that not everyone who has survived neck and is now an adult recognizes that the symptoms they're going through is because of neck their complications from neck and so just being able to identify that oh that's what this is stemming from is like one issue but we have begun that outreach um to pgi and, and we're starting with pgi and, and building those relationships and building those connections so that we can do more of this work and to be able to kind of implement these prioritize priorities and put them into um, action and, and research so we're working on it and would love to collaborate with anyone else that's willing to join us 
And Jen, I wonder if you want to just touch on kind of it's part of the rare disease community. A lot of, as Lindsay mentioned, these are maybe not uncommon, but how can we actually use the tools and leverage community to try to try to understand um, these outcomes from kind of the broad community and connect with them? And I, I wonder if you want to touch on a, a little bit of what's um, happening with kind of um, some of the work with um, Rares One and, and Nord. Yeah, with the NEC registry. So that's one thing that we are, are working to build is um, a platform where, where families can actually go in and provide and share the information that they are comfortable sharing so that we can begin to gain a better understanding of what, what are the long-term outcomes at, you know, years after their original NEC diagnosis. What are those experiences? What are those impacts? What are those life outcomes? And how are they shaping um, physical, social, emotional um, growth and development? Um, so that's in the works right now. We don't have a firm date and timeline in terms of when it will launch, but it's something we are actively working on um, as efficiently as possible and are really committed to um, launching as soon as we can. The other thing, uh, Jen, I wanted to comment is the, you know, the, around the patient family area, the, you know, some of the questions and that we posed in that, in that heading, related to uh, the communication of information across the whole uh, spectrum of the hospital stay. And I, I think that's something that's really valuable is putting a weight uh, to that commodity of, of, of the communication for the patient families, because um, we don't do as much, we categorize you know, a treatment or a particular test. And this is a nice way for us to really elevate it some quantify quantification of the the importance of, of having a well communicated and well engaged family in the in the overall process and saying we need to do research on that because it's as valuable as finding a treatment because you know we're looking at the burden and the pain and suffering that is a big source of things so i i think that's one thing i'm really happy that that we were able to elevate a patient family um, topic and and then use that to be more objective um, around that. Yeah, absolutely, Jay, thank you for articulating that. And it looks like we're ready to kind of open it up. And so if um, others in the audience have questions or comments that you would like to share, I see a lot of just comments around just how grateful um, you all are about the focus on long term outcomes. So again, um, thank you for those comments. Um, but any other questions you're welcome to put into the Q&A box um, or the chat box also. And any other questions that um, the team might have here for each other. <laughs> one of the, the, the maybe questions and comments is, you know, one of the, at, our goal here was really to focus on patient-centered outcomes research and comparative effectiveness research. But there was, we did at the beginning actually rank and evaluate kind of, you know, very, very uh, fundamental science and preclinical research. And I wonder what your thoughts are on kind of this process, which to my knowledge hasn't been done for kind of areas of neck research that are outside of, um, outside of kind of patients that are outcomes research and preclinical research. And maybe even in, in that area, how do we uh, engage and, and work with diverse stakeholders and something, a, a process like that? I wonder if you have thoughts of that. I know some of, some of the people joining here are are basic scientists who do fundamental research in terms of understanding why babies develop neck and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, we can specifically, um, you know, talk about the biorepository, like how do we engage families in that type of work? I don't know if you all have an idea on that. One effort that we've, um, you know, work to do is to integrate the patient and family voice and perspective around the consenting process. And so how are families approached for research and how can we make it, um, you know, how can we approach them in a way that recognizes the trauma that they are experiencing and helps them to feel potentially more comfortable and at ease participating in a research project like this, given them the grief that they are potentially experiencing in that moment. But other ideas would be great. Jenna, I would raise the area around probiotics as an interesting um, arena right now. And it just goes to the collision of the 
scientific medical community and where the parents uh, sit from their perspective. And so I think it's about trying to find um, ways to have broader ability to communicate around these research topics. So in the case of probiotics, you know, there's controversy right now in, in neonatology whether we should or should not use probiotics. And But it's a little more of a siloed and ivory tower approach that the their recommendations. And so sometimes the messaging that happens to the parents is that there's, there's, it's, it's unclear exactly what the truth is. And if there's uncertainty, we often as a medical community don't reflect that uncertainty. And so I think this opens a, a lot more opportunity for us to say, let's take uh, these topics and really crack it open where, where the language that we speak it allows us to communicate up uh, to the broadest level and to be as open and transparent about what, what we know and what we don't know and then where, where we can um, really forge forward. That's a great point, Jay. And I think, you know, along those same lines is taking those values of integrating the patient and family voice and perspective and making sure that families are, are viewed and, and treated as an equal uh, we valuable member of the team is making sure that families have access to the tools and information they need, right, to engage and to participate. And um, I'm thinking about like the probiotic toolkit that we are building and just the different resources that we have on our website that are designed to allow patient families to engage in a way that without them, they wouldn't be able to. Like, how can you engage if you don't have access to the information that's needed to contribute? So really taking that whole mindset and, and like shifting it, not just um, to research, but also just broader in terms of how we allow families access to more information so they can contribute in a really effective and meaningful way. Yeah, I was also thinking that some of the topics that we came up with when we talked, when we showed the questions that related to the topics, some of them are very practical and don't require MDs to explore. For example, the um, the breast milk and whether fresh milk or frozen milk, whether one or the other is better for you know prevention of neck, or maybe even for feeding tolerance after neck. Um, you know, questions like that are ones that if when you're designing a study, engaging the family might be really important, even though it seems simple. But the fact that not every mother is at the bedside every day because when these babies are in the hospital for months at a time, it's it's just impossible for families to be there all the time. So somehow integrating the practicality of how do you keep the milk fresh if you're at home, if you're randomized to be the fresh milk cohort, or you know how do you freeze it if you're the one who's in the hospital all the time? So when we try to work out some of these practical things and um, that involve mother's care for the baby, um, certainly getting them engaged would be vital in, from the, from the get-go. I guess I just wanted to piggyback off of um, something that Jennifer had mentioned about accessibility. I think that um, in order to really engage more patients and families, um, we have to really start thinking about the language that we use. We tend to use a lot of jargon. A lot of patient families don't even know what patient family means to begin with. So um, if we really are serious about bringing them, bringing them into this work, we need to think about, okay, we say research prioritization. What does that mean? for them? What does a biorepository mean? Um, so we have to start thinking about things in simpler terms, not, not in a condescending way either, though, just breaking it down and just being considerate of the fact that not everyone who is a patient or a family member has um, a medical background or a scientific background. Super important. Thank you. I love Erin's question um, in the chat box around how we engage and encourage um, other research funders beyond PCORI to value patient-centered research um, and patient family engagement. And um, how do we get them to fund, like how do we get NIH to potentially fund um, research that's really about patient family centeredness and elevating that patient family perspective? Thoughts on that? I honestly feel like the patient family voice is one of the more compelling ways that we can do this. I think, of course, like, it would be wonderful and we should have clinicians and researchers advocating along with us. 
But I think for patient and families to show up and to tell our really compelling stories and um, really insist on access and insist that we be listened to, I think, honestly, I think that's how we create change is um, standing up and, and taking up space and letting people know we're here and what we have to say matters and that we want to contribute to the process. So I don't know what others think. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, go ahead, you go. Go, go for it. <laughs> I, I was just going to reiterate what you said. I, I think it's exactly that. I think the way you run the next society in in every presentation or every webinar, starting with a patient family story is the only way we're going to to kind of create that change and, and get that that voice, I suppose. And in order for the funding situation to change. I think it's got to be us that leads it because otherwise I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think we need clinicians to support us in saying that, you know, actually this, this has worked really well and this is really important, but I think we do have to stand up together and, and, you know, tell our stories and, and share our children. And, and that is at the end of the day, why, why we're doing the research, you know, sorry, Jay. No, I was just going to agree with you. I think we need to speak up louder as a community. I think nothing really good comes unless we're a, a true advocate. And that means being louder, a lot louder. And, and, and when you work together and we resonate, then it's easier to have a single voice and be able to be heard versus, you know, a hundred voices saying different things. So I think that's, that's tremendous power. The other quick comment was that even in medicine, we are starting to diverge in, in terms of communication between the scientific community and the medical community. There's a disconnect as science gets even more complicated for scientists to be able to communicate to, to the physician side. And, and so I think communication is a really important thing that we need to do to make research more understandable by even the people at the NIH and at, at the grass level by the people in the lay, lay uh, environment. It's just we need to be better communicators of science um, across the board. Jay, I wonder, uh, we, we have a question here. Just what do you mean? Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by being louder? What does that entail? I think it means being uh, more, more present in the, uh, the communities of, that are beyond just what we're used to. So in the public, having uh, more engagement with uh, administration, with hospitals, with um, uh, the governmental agencies at a true advocacy level and, inter and being um, more diverse in the way uh, we communicate uh, just across, across, just broadly. Pediatrics tends to be a quiet, uh, relatively quiet uh, area. And, and I think we can learn from other areas that are just much more vocal and, and, and push a cause much, much further. And so I, I think this is something that I've, we have witnessed by Next Society really putting a large lens to a, this condition. There's been such good progress. Um, and I think we need to be louder. I agree. And I think we can be strategic about it. I really like how you said, you know, we all need to be on the same page, right? Like advocating for the same thing and um, make the, the vision clear, measurable, um, and consistent, and really bringing as many voices to that table as possible and really just showing up in these spaces so people know we exist and we know we're here and they, they know um, what we want and what we're asking for. So I, I totally agree. Um, I was going to let Brian unmute himself. I'm gonna let's see. Brian, would you do you have a question? Um, it, it, <clears throat> it wasn't necessarily a question. It was to build on what had been said in this uh, in this topic area. Yeah, please we, please go. For we have. Uh, I mean, we building on what Jay just said. There's definitely less 
mm, prevalent <laughs> diseases that happen at the end of folks' lives, and I'm not trying to discount those, but that receive far more funding than this uh, terrible condition that happens at the beginning of folks' lives and that we don't even know what the long-term consequences are really and impacts uh, many babies per year, you know, uh, and, and they live long lives. So the aggregate number in the world who've had necrotizing interpolitis far out numbers, many other diseases that get a lot more funding. And so I think you, the platform that's been provided through the Next Society and all the work of those who've uh, you know, contributed to that does, I think, give the basis for what has been just mentioned, which is that single voice. And then to use that voice to speak loudly uh, along with the patient, uh, patients and patient families to do something that changes it, that gets, um, gets the needle to move. Because, you know, as researchers or clinicians, have spoken quietly using Jay's term and as a you know pediatric problem. It just doesn't seem like it gets any attention, uh, and um, but it really deserves a lot more attention. And it seems like we're poised to be able to do that given the work that's been done thus far, um, and even the fact that there was a legislative session <laughs> that was planned that got also COVID, uh, you know, diverted. And I just I think we've got to really work hard to make people aware that this is a problem. And it's not just a problem to the patients or the patient families, but it also impacts the care of every neonate in a negative way. Um, and I'm hopeful that that will change over the course of the next couple of years. Thank you so much. That's great. Any um, final, oh, is there one in the, let's see. Does the next society have the resources to help with the development of existing or novel therapies it grants? So thank you for that question, Patrick. We are working really hard at growing that capacity. And um, so we don't have the capacity now to provide seed grants, for example, but that is something that we are actively working to do and to grow. And so we hope to be there within the next few years, but we're not there yet. Um, but there are other ways that we have and will continue to support research. We collaborate, we have team members that can work with you. So um, I would say, well, since you're on this webinar, you're going to um, automatically be added to our email list and then stay tuned in terms of how you can potentially get involved in the Next Society Incubator that we're gonna be launching soon and then other opportunities to continue to grow with, with us. So thank you. Um, be included in the NEC registry. That's a really great question, Diana. Thank you for asking. And we will be sure to consider that as we're building the NEC registry question. So thank you for that. Um, Ravi, do you want to, anything else before we go back to the slides? I just have a I, I, question. I just wanted to highlight, you know, as if, from the research perspective, as we think about the future pipeline of people who are going to study this disease, I think I think it's incredibly inspiring and motivating to, to have patients and families there. And I think both to coalesce and motivate and get people who might be in their silos to collaborate with each other. And also, I think it's important for the future generation to be able to be to learn how, how important the work they're doing is um, in the field. And so I just wanted to thank you for that and, and, and to, to the comment about kind of what can we do for, um, you know, in, in uh, fostering research outside of the work we're trying to do. I think this is incredibly powerful. So, and also to, to our, our team, who's just been amazing through this process and incredibly dedicated and committed to, to the work over the last, um, the last couple of years. Thank you. And I also want to just celebrate everyone that has been working on these research priorities at your own institution and your own labs for a number of years. Like we celebrate and thank you and are just so grateful to partner and collaborate to move this work forward. Um, Ravi, if you want to bring anything else before we bring up the slides and start moving forward. All right, I want to um, highlight the team. I don't think every single person is um, on this little collage, but really highlight and thank everyone that contributed to um, the leadership team. We are so grateful to each of these individuals and more who make our work possible. Um, so what is next and how can you as an individual stay engaged in our work? So I just briefly mentioned we're working to launch what we're calling the Next Society Incubator. And what that's going to encompass is a lot of things that's related to advancing research. So it's going to be when the next society has our own research project that we're leading that's uh, directly a result of this priority effort um, that will be fall under the incubator and we'll look for incubator members to engage in and participate with us. We're going to build a mentorship program to build up 
um, individuals who are currently perhaps in training and haven't really um, found someone in the next community who can serve as their mentor. Um, we hope to be able to match patient and families who have you know, gone through and experienced the devastation of NEC, um, come back and go through something like the PCORI Research Fundamentals Training, where they know how to contribute to a research team, and then they are eager and able and um, have what they need to contribute to um, one of the incubator research projects. So lots of exciting things coming up with the incubator. And um, we also wanna expand our collaborations with um, the NICHC, CHNC, PAS. I know I'm using a lot of acronyms, but a lot of people probably understand what I'm talking about. We really wanna expand who we're collaborating with and the work that we can do when we work together and have one voice um, in this effort. We can be louder. Um, we also are going to be publishing a guide for other rare disease neonatal communities so they can learn from this prioritization work, what we did, how we did it, and so they can hopefully avoid some of our mistakes and learn from the lessons that um, we went through over the last couple of years. And then we will have that kind of more fo formal publication that will be um, published in um, an academic journal. If we could go to the next slide, um, what else you can do to stay engaged, please check out and share the three videos. Erin um, has shared it a couple of times in the chat box. Um, but they're meant um, to be watched kind of um, in, in order. And so we have a first, second, and third video that really breaks down the work that we did, why we did it, and um, hope that you will please watch and share them. And we also have a lot of resources on our website at nextsociety.org. I mentioned we have, I believe, about 16 webinar recordings that are on our website. We have a lot of tools for families, for clinicians, and we have more to come, including our probiotic toolkit that we are actively working on for centers that are interested in implementing probiotics um, to help reduce the, the risk of NAC in their units. We also have, I'm very excited about our August webinar. So let me go to the next slide. Look at that amazing graphic that Erin put together for us. So we're gonna be uh, exploring modeling NAC with a few really amazing um, researchers who we love to partner with, um, Steve McElroy, Misty Good, and Hala Chavan, and really excited. So please save the date. Registration is open. I believe my colleague Erin just shared that link in the chat box. So we hope that you will uh, join us for that webinar. We'll have more webinars coming up in the fall as well that we'll release um, in the coming months. So stay tuned. It is still Neck Awareness Month. Um, again, we focused this whole month around the lack of answers that we have when it comes to this disease and how it's a mystery and we have so many questions and we want to solve it. So you can help us um, solve the mysteries of NEC by supporting our work, by getting involved, by letting other people know that we exist, um, telling other people that you're involved in the NEC society and just really helping us raise awareness. So thank you to everyone who's already doing this um, and for making this work possible. We're really, really incredibly grateful for you all. And also want to share that we're excited for uh, Pride Month that Next Society will be recognizing throughout June. The Next Society intentionally prioritizes diversity, equity, inclusion in everything that we do and we're constantly striving to do better. So we um, hope that you'll check out our inclusivity uh, statement that we have on our website and join us for that. And we also have shops that I'd like to tell you about. We have a regular kind of standard Next Society logo shops and some rainbow pride gear as well. So you can check out our shop um, to support the Next Society and help us raise awareness. So I wanna thank you all again so much for tuning in, for being part of this work, for dedicating your time and energy and expertise. And really thank you to the patient families who make this work possible. We would not be here without you. So thank you all so much again for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks everybody.